Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. My guest this week is Steve Cantwell. Steve is a former mixed martial artist and entrepreneur known for his time in the UFC and his involvement with Green Life Productions. Steve was born in Long Beach, California, and he began training in martial arts at a young age and developed a passion for combat sports. In 2005, Cantwell made his professional MMA debut and quickly gained attention for his aggressive fighting style and well-rounded skills. He amassed an impressive record in regional promotions, which led to his signing with the UFC in 2008. In recent years, Cantwell has focused his entrepreneurial endeavors, particularly in the cannabis industry. He founded Green Life Productions in 2014, a prominent Las Vegas-based cannabis cultivation company. GLP is known for its organic and sustainable approach to cannabis cultivation, producing high-quality cannabis. Cantwell's involvement with GLP has allowed him to combine his passion for entrepreneurship with his interest in health and wellness. His contributions to the company reflect his ongoing dedication to promoting sustainable and responsible practices within the cannabis industry. Now on to the show. All right, well, let's... uh... Let's talk cover crops. You brought them up. Um, you're a big proponent. There's very few commercial facilities that I see successfully running cover crops indoors and showing it online. Um, I have a lot of guys I've worked with that have tried it and failed. Um, I'm not a huge proponent of cover crops indoors, not because I don't think they have some benefits, but for me, the cons outweigh the pros. But let's talk about what those pros and cons are and why it works so well for you and your facility. So I'll let you start. Yeah. Um, first off, uh, if you plan on using cover crops, listen to everything Tad says, because uh, if you don't, you're going to make him right. Okay. Because <laughs> everything he says has a, he has a point. He's not, he's not making stuff up. It's not, it's, it's a very, um, you walk a thin line when rubbing cover crops indoors uh, and cover crops in general, um, going plants in general. Um, so I think there's definitely some people who kind of overdo it. They have too much fun with it um, and they create more work and responsibility than is intended. Uh, so like we run a very basic cover crop, um, and I, and I do mix it up from time to time based off of what we're facing both indoors and outdoors. Um, but for the most part, I mean, I, I see the benefit of it. Uh, it's, again, it's, it's not a perfect um, process, um, uh, but you know, nothing in farming is perfect. Uh, the benefits that we find from it, again, I feel like it creates this shelter, this living mulch creates this shelter over my soil that keeps my soil organisms where they're supposed to be in the soil and keeps things from just blowing up all over my plants. I really do. That's a huge component in the, in the cover crop. Obviously, um, we, we spend a lot of money on light. You know, so in early in veg, my, my cannabis plants aren't catching all that light. Uh, if, I, if I let it hit that soil, I'm just wasting energy. So I like the idea of, you know, cover crops and catching that light and photosynthesizing and turning it into energy that my soil and plants can use further at a further date. Um, so I think there's a little bit of efficiency there. Is it juice worth the squeeze? I don't know. Um, but uh, for the most part, it's, it's just one thing I use. I, I've used a part of my IPM program. So I'll, I'll plant specific cover crops to attract pests. I'll plant cover crops to appel, repel pests. Like we had a rat issue real bad one time. The year of the rat, or like, you know, like two years ago. Um, yeah, the year of the rat. And it, it hit this whole town hardcore. Uh, and we got some rats in. I, I started noticing some um, um, predator packs would get destroyed, um, would get eaten. Um, so we quickly started doing some research and, and, and my mind the way it works what's a natural predator for cat uh, for rats so we got a cat and put it to the cat next door um got some uh in our warehouse and then uh we put mints in our bed so I, I i blew out my whole beds with mints um and the rats never came back uh we've never seen after mints took over our beds we've never seen a single rat in this facility um but then i let the mint, mint get too far um didn't cold the mint in time and that shit's super invasive uh yeah. and i had to pull a bunch of mint out so now i had to learn how to better manage that mint it was good for one thing um but a double-edged sword it, it turned around and it kind of bit me in the butt on the other side so um if you are going to use a can uh, a cover crops i recommend picking with like one basic variety uh, with like a dichondra start with that that's your blanket cover crop. It doesn't really serve a whole lot of purposes other than just covering the soil. All right. And then if you start to add other little things, have a reason for it uh, and then have a place for it. Like you can't judge a fish by how well it climbs a tree. 
um, because you have it in the wrong place, put it in the water, then see how well it swims, then make your judgment, you know? Um, so I feel like if you, if you have a, pl a purpose for these cover crop or these, these companion plants and, and you put them in the right place, um, then they can add value to the system. But if you're just going in there and throwing seeds, doing the little salt dust thing, uh, and just having this beautiful, lush cover crops of flowers everywhere, yeah, it looks good for IG. Don't get me wrong. Some of my most high tracks and pictures are ones with marigolds in it. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're, you're creating more work than you want. The whole idea of creating these systems is to create systems that manage themselves. Like That's why I love worms. Because if I were to pay somebody to do a worm's job, they wouldn't do it as good and it costs a whole lot more money. Um, so finding these systems that are easy to manage, that make life easier, not harder. Um, it, it's a fine line. Um, and, and we walk it every single day. Yeah. And some of the other benefits that you, you, I don't know if you touched on were sort of water management. Um, it's going to keep that, uh, initial level of the soil, the first couple inches, a lot, uh, a lot more moist. Um, and by keeping active plants in there and roots, you're going to, you're, you're probably getting better nutrient cycling in that soil before the cannabis plant really has a chance to take off. Um, yeah. I, so I those are some it. more yeah, was, pros, uh, pros of cover crops. I was say, I look at it as like diversity thing. If you want more diversity, diversity is good. Um, it helps to have more diverse cover crop or more diverse plants in the system, um, that then attract and grow different, you know, microbial communities. Um, so I, I try to have, you know, as many as I can afford to take care of uh, plants in the system. Like right now we're gearing up to, to, to do our marigold runs again, to get some flowering plants in the rooms again. Um, I, in springtime every year, I cut back and I just run, run a dichondra and wood chips, minimize any potential risk from the outside. And then anything I do is more of a trap plant. So it's a trap plant. So I'll put them in the trap plant in the corner of the room um, for my cover crop or for my companion plant that, that cycle. Um, but yeah, it's a... I think as long as you're mulching, I, I'm, I'm just a proponent of mulching. Uh, I think you're okay whether it's living mulch or, or you know, brown mulch, whatever the case may be. Um, I'm just a huge proponent for covering your soil in general. Um, but yeah, obviously I'm a cover crop guy. And to be clear, the first time I saw cover crops was uh, my buddy Brad Thurman showed me Matt Davenport's Instagram like eight years ago. And uh, he had some clovers in the bottom of his pots. And I thought it was the stupidest thing I ever seen. And I'll never forget like, uh, the, the thought, like, this lazy dude's not even pulling weeds. Like, this is so lazy. They're stealing nutrients. Like, all these things went off. And here I am, eight years later, kind of known for it. So it's kind of funny. That is funny. I See, the first time I thought I saw it, I was like, oh, that's so cool. What a great idea. <laughs> um, and then I kind of backed off and changed my mind over time. So it's we've went opposite directions. Um, well, I think you covered the reasons folks would choose to use cover crops really well. Um, I want to give my thoughts, but before I do, uh, what what cover crops will you not use? You you mentioned some that you really like, but what what will you just never use as a cover crop besides mint? Well, no, I'll use mint. Um, I just I'll just make sure I cull it at the end of every cycle. I won't let it grow so wild. Um, so the the mint, the, I, I still think mint has a value in the system, especially if you're in an area where there's rats or things like that. It could definitely help out. Um, just don't let it grow wild. You definitely want to chop and drop it, pull it back, cull it as much as possible. Um, one cover crop that I won't use indoors. All right, I, I will use this out. I'm about to use it outdoors. Won't use it indoors ever again. Um, is clover. Uh, I, I think it's too much risk versus reward. Uh, I think there's a lot easier ways to get nitrogen back into the system um, than attracting pests and, and disease like uh, like clover does. Anytime I've ever had a pest outbreak, um, it fed off the clover heavily. Um, so we eventually culled all the clover from all of our soils, um, placed it with dichondra. Nothing really likes dichondra. I mean, shit may linger on dichondra a little bit, um, but nothing's going out of their way for dichondra. Um, so that's kind of been like the ground cover that we, we choose to use. Um, clover's done though. Um, anything i wouldn't use oh crawling stuff uh anything that's gonna crawl out the plants um obviously like it's, it's when you're growing 500 plants you, you can't afford to be you know pulling you know bean stalks and and all these little vets and all these little crazy things out of your cannabis canopy uh, so use things that are definitely low laying cover crops for sure um other than that i mean again time and place for everything yeah. And I will say like, I think you brought up another good point and that is that, you know, use your cover crop with a purpose. Um, all cover crops have different purposes, whether that's to break up the soil better, um, or to add nitrogen or to create more organic matter. Um, 
you're going to grow a different co cover crop for that. There's no perfect cover crop. Um, and a lot of people will run like multi, multi-species cover crops outdoors. And I love cover crops outdoors. I think they make a ton of sense. The reasons, and I'll, I'll list the reasons why I don't like cover crops indoors so much. And then, you know, growers can make their own decisions based on their own facility. And I don't, just because someone used cover crops, I don't think they're a bad grower or that they're making a bad decision. I just think people need to be educated on why they do what they do. So for me with cover crops, it's, it's another crop that you have to manage. Um, and in a commercial facility, that can be problematic because you already have your hands full a lot of times managing your, your cannabis plant, your cash crop. That's what's bringing in your revenue and your business. Um, in addition to that, uh, I really like to mix my nutrients into the soil to get it back into the rhizosphere as fast as possible because we're cropping five cycles uh, a year. We're going a little faster um, than than what you're doing at, at Green Life, and so um, we want to get those nutrients right into the rhizosphere where the plant can have them. And, and I like a little bit of disturbance in my soil. You mentioned this whole idea of, of cannabis being a little more bacterial. Um, I don't have a problem with a little bit of soil disturbance. I'm not tilling my beds. Keep in mind, you know, we're not using a mechanical tiller. We're just digging in some nutrients. And I think that's a very different process that people don't consider when they talk about, you know, tilling versus no till. We're not tilling indoors. Um, I think that cannabis uh, agriculture in general is artificial. We're selecting for a crop here. Um, so the diversity that we have in, uh, you know, a given indoor space is not or even outdoors is not going to be anywhere near the diversity that we see in a healthy forest ecosystem or a prairie land or something like that so um i i like to pull what practices we can from nature i think mother nature is amazing and we want to use those practices but we want to use them strategically i'm not creating flood events you know or um doing you know blasting my plants with wind because a tornado may occur in nature, you know, these sorts of things. So I, I just want to be aware that like what we're doing is artificial um, and we're doing it in the sense of trying to create the best yields and the best uh, plants that we can, um, not just because it's a business, because we're, but also because we're growing this plant because we love it and, you know, it's medicine for a lot of people. Um, and then the last point that I have around cover crops for me is, we're growing this indoors in controlled environment agriculture. We can control the environment. So that's one more variable that we have to add to this. And there's already so many variables in cultivation. Um, I don't like the risk of the pest pressures that it may bring in. You know, you mentioned clover crops, my, my brain or cover crops with clover. My, my brain immediately goes to thrips. Um, like I, I don't like the risk of having that. And then, um, Oh, I thought of one other point. So last thing is hop late and viroid. Um, I like to now pull roots because we know that hop latent is uh, in higher viroid levels are in the root system than in the leaf tissue. And we can test for that better by testing roots. So I want to pull the roots to lower the viral load in my soil because at the end of the day, I'm not ready to throw this whole living soil methodology out just because we have... Um, you know, hop late and viroid now in our, in, in most facilities. And it's such a problem in our industry. So, all right. What are your thoughts? All right. Well, first we jumped to the, the, the hop latent thing before I wasn't ready for that one. Uh, let's back up a little bit though. So you can tackle that one too, though. Um, to, to your point though. Yeah. If, if, you're, if you're trying to use cover crops, the whole idea is like you said, we have a whole lot to manage. We're trying to manage a cash crop. You have to be in order to be regenerative. You have to be sustainable um, and run a good business. So you, you, there, there is a fine line. Like I said, you have to walk. Um, in my situation, I, I'm literally setting up the easiest self-managing cover cropping systems they possible. Like when I do put a banker plant or a trap plant, uh, I'm not planting it throughout my whole facility. I'm, I'm planting in very specific areas, um, like at the end, the corners of our beds while I'll plant like marigolds. So if you look at old GLP photos, start to look at where some of our marigolds or some more of our more companion, not cover crops, but our companion plants are placed. Um, they're then placed in a high traffic area where it's easy for us to manage them, where it's easy for us to see if there's a problem or not. Um, so we, we try to minimize um, the workload at 100% because um, there's a lot going on, especially with the, the whole regulated side of things um, to manage, not just the whole health of the cash crop. We have all these crazy things going on. So you definitely want to simplify, take the best of what we, can, what we can learn from nature and apply it. Um, I go a little bit further with it than some do, no doubt. Uh, but it's, it's not to say that... Uh, I'm, I'm just going willy nilly. I'm not just getting lucky. Um, everything that we do has an SOP um, designed around it. 
Um, and, and we manage these things very, very, very thoroughly and precisely. And I see a lot of people doing things that I was doing eight years ago, um, but just going crazy with their cover crops. And I, I'm stoked for them. They're having fun. They're learning. Oh, at least I hope they're learning and they're paying attention. Um, but I expect to see you know the, the, those people in years to come um, sharpen their sticks a little bit and, and minimize some of those potential risks like you talked about. Um, I can't remember some of the other points now because I'm, I'm, I'm stuck on, on the uh, – uh, hop Latin viroid um, part of it now, uh, but you you yeah, uh, all I, I points, threw a lot at you. All your points are good though, and validated points. Um, but yeah, I just just I just see them a little bit differently as far as some of the solutions to them goes and how to use them. Uh, but as far as the the, the hop Latin viroid, um, so when we first opened up, um, we had I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think back in the day everybody was referring to them as duds. Like I think Pip Sweed uh, was a dude online, and we called them duds. Uh, we call mm -hmm. them over here at GLP, we call them uh, shiners, um, back to that pure sunshine strain. Um, so, uh, and in medicinal genomics. Um, so back in the day, pure sunshine um, had a hot plant viroid real bad. Um, we, uh, it, it, every single time I planted in a bed, it would dud out, like 50, 60% of that bed would dud out. I didn't think it was a virus because I didn't see it spreading to other plants. So for like two years, I, I, I thought I thought it was like a mutation. I thought that back in the day, it was was a mutation, it was a viroid. There was all these topic or all these conversations going on. Um, and I was on team mutation based off of what I was seeing on my, on, on my commercial grow. Uh, I thought if it was a if it was a virus, it would spread like wildfire throughout the whole room. Um, and I just wasn't seeing that. Um, we eventually pu uh, pulled the pure sunshine because of that. We we couldn't grow it no more. It was just too much of a pain in the ass. Um, and I'll be honest, I don't see it anymore. I, I we used to see the occasional dudding plant. We used to see the occasional sick plant, um, and 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 I just don't see it no more. And in the living organic system, and I leave roots in the system. And and as far as root balls go, um, yeah, you have a great point. Um, but early on, we would harvest our root balls um to, to make room for the next pot and what we found out that we were doing is we were harvesting the majority of the life that we just grew um the worms the bacteria the fungi um those are all nesting right there feeding off those exudates so every time we remove that root ball we just kind of took two steps back we took one foot step forward two steps back um it got so bad to where our, our our worms uh population our beds was almost none um just harvesting the root balls over and over again um, so we, that's when we started designing our, our grid technique where we plant here one cycle, then the next cycle we plant right next to it, allowing this root ball to break down and then all the biology do its thing. Um, and again, uh, I, I don't have, I don't have dudding plants. I haven't seen a dudding plant since I got rid of pure sunshine. Now that's not to say that this virus isn't real. I just believe that, Hey, it's, it's always been there. Uh, I think certain plants are going to, you know, hold certain viral loads more than others. Certain they're more susceptible. Um, but if I had it my way, every plant in my facility um, would, would be, I don't want to say immune, but would, would, would have a little, would be, had to be able to tolerate this virus. Um, that way I'm not have to worry about it because I've seen people that tissue culture, 100% of their, t their propagation method is to tissue culture because this virus. Uh, I feel like that's a bit overkill. Uh, I, I've, I've literally walked in some of the most highest state of the art facilities with 100% tissue culture propagation pr uh, process and, and, and sealed rooms this and sealed rooms that. And then they're showing this whole tissue culture um, set up. And then I go to one of their flowering rooms and it looks like a powdered donut factory because their facility has powdered milk. It's not their plants um, and things of that nature. So I feel like if, if viruses are real, they're definitely out there. I'm not to belittle that. Um, I, I think it's a bit of a of a scare tactic, though. Just from a commercial pr perspective, I, I just don't see it as much as I used to when I got rid of the strains that contained it or that 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 showed it. Um, nowadays, I it's not even really a topic here at GLP. We don't see it no more. I mean, there is there is research to show that certain genetics are going to not express it as much, um, based on the work by Dr. Punja. Um, my next podcast that's actually going to come out before this one will be all on hop latent viroid. Uh, so I, I learned a lot on that too. Um, the dudding thing I think is interesting because uh, like from working closely with my buddy, Justin at Mako farms in, and he absolutely has it cause we've tested for it there. Um, he finds that he, if he can keep the plants healthy and not stressed. He doesn't see that expression of, of dudding or the viroid itself. So like you, I think if we can keep a plant healthy and reduce stress, um, 
we're not going to see that expression of it because it is a latent viroid, um, and that helps a lot. So coming in with clean plants, even if your bed is, um, you know, you had plants with brutes that had the viroid, um, you're still able. He he crops huge huge yields and pulls a ton of biomass, and I know you do too. So I, I know it is possible. Um, one other reason I like to pull roots because you mentioned the worms thing and, and the bacteria and fungi, and I think that's that's interesting. Um, one of the reasons I like to pull roots is because of heavy metals as well. So lowering viral load, removing heavy metals from the system um, through through biomass again, um, I think is important if if that's an issue for for a lot of facilities. And then um, for us with the worms, what we see is we see a lot of our worms coming up on the blue soak tape um, or where the irrigation systems are. Um, so I wonder if because of the, your watering and um, I guess you're watering the whole bed because you have cover crops in there. My thought was maybe a lot of your worm populations are going to be more concentrated in the root ball versus what we're seeing them being more along where the irrigation lines are run. Um, Cause I haven't noticed a large change in, in worm populations uh, based off of how long, were, but you were yeah. probably shaking the, the, the roots back into the bed or the, the, sorry, the soil. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when we harvest, typically we, we, you know, you, you get the plant out and then you shake off the soil and then you take the, you know, root. so we're not getting all the root hairs and, and everything out of the bed. It's, it's a pretty quick, simple process. Yeah. That, that, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Ours are a little bit different, uh, but real quick back to the, the, the virus too. Um, it's all about setting the stage too. So I, I think if you, you know, people always ask, Oh, you, you have all these bacteria and fungi and how do they not, how, how do these bad ones not take over? How do you not get botrytis? How do you not get a uh, hot Latin viral? How do you not get all these things? Uh, it's cause I'm not setting the stage for those things that we try to, you know, maintain a healthy aerobic environment, uh, full of diversity, um, of beneficial organisms. But you know, typically you have to set the stage like similar to the whole, don't judge a, a fish by how well it climbs a tree. Um, if I keep that fish in the water, it's going to do great. You know, if, if I keep that cat out of the water in, in the tree, it's going to do great. Uh, so just setting the stage for, for, for whatever it is that you're trying to do for the proper outcome, I think is key. Uh, so good air circulation, good filtration, um, good, healthy aerobic soil, good, good, um, good compost, all, all these things, good practices are going to help set the stage for success. Uh, where if you're willy nilly in going in there, you know, hand watering without a meter, um, you're not following the schedule. You're doing all these crazy cool kid techniques you see on, on the Instagram. Um, what are you setting the stage for? You know? Yeah. And you've brought up your SOPs multiple times. Um, I did a recent podcast with Cassandra Maffey just talking about SOPs. I don't think people give enough credit to how important SOPs are and following them because, um, that's, I think that's what makes a, separates kind of like a good grower from a great grower or a, or a bad grower from a good grower is having SOPs and following them. Yeah, no, it's definitely key. Um, like I, I don't grow for the most part, I don't grow cannabis anymore. Uh, I, I grow employees, um, and, and they, they follow <laughs> SOPs that I wrote. Um, and, and it's, and it's clutch that way. If something goes wrong, we can look back to, Hey, what did you do? Did you follow the SOP? Oh, you didn't. Okay, well, that's the problem, and we can always kind of find the problem that way and work towards a solution. Um, but then also, state regulators—they're going to ask for SOPs. Like when when state regulators come in, and especially that what they've only seen clean, sterile grows, and they start seeing all these crazy cover crops and and and, and, and beneficial insects everywhere, um, they're going to want to see SOPs that show that you're in control of these things, that you're in control of these processes. Um, otherwise, they're going to deem everything a pest and disease and shut you down. So, uh, SOPs are definitely the way to go. Um, yeah, hundred percent. I hate it. I hate writing them. Uh, my wife is, uh, is really big on SOPs. She just raised her hand. Shout out to Kwanine. Uh, that's kind of her strength, uh, is, is the, the whole, she takes my craziness and it makes it legal. Basically she put, put makes it fits into regulation. Yeah. Let's give a shout out to your wife because, uh, I know she does a lot behind the scenes. I know you're the face of GLP, but I know that she's really the heart of it too. And, uh, I don't think she gets enough credit for everything she does. She lays low. She, she, she stays out of the limelight dude, but she's definitely, um, it's, it, I basically built her business. Basically I, I built a business for her to run. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. So, uh, I feel like we covered a lot in this podcast. Um, one thing that we absolutely need to talk about though, before signing off is, um, bottomless pots and this tech, this tech that you came up with. Um, I think it's really interesting. Why don't you share sort of your, your thought process and then how it's been working in reality? 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, when we first uh, started GLP, um, we were digging um, half gallon gallon pots um, into our soil. So we dig out the soil we took out. We then go into a bin. Uh, we put a pot in there. That's all we took out. We then go into the next cycle um, of edge. Uh, and that was our whole process for a long time. And and then we just that's when we started harvesting our worms and things like that by taking out the old roots. That's when we designed a root system. I'm sorry, a grid pattern to where you plant here one cycle, plant here the next cycle. So we're just constantly switching grids each cycle. Um, but we were still digging holes. There's still quite a bit of soil disturbance. Um, trying to stay true to the whole um, no till uh, or no soil disturbance um, uh, mm -hmm. scheme of things. Uh, it just never kind of felt right. Uh, it just felt like we we're kind of I don't know taking a step back every time. Uh, and then one day I, uh, I had a, a seed plant uh, and it's a small pot and I was supposed to transplant it, got busy, forgot to transplant it. I sat down on the mother bed, never got around to it and came back like a week later and this plant compl it was, it was totally stressed out and yellowing. Um, a week later was just completely blown up, regreened, um, super healthy. Uh, I went to grab it to move it and it was, it was stuck to the bed and, and I was like, man, this is kind of kind of like the old rock wool. They said the little rock wool and the big rock wool, um, kind of technique and my, my, gears just started rolling just thinking about all the labor we can save um if we didn't have to dig holes and the mess that we wouldn't have to make if we didn't have to dig holes and uh so i just took a i think it was 12 pots um i cut the bottoms off plastic pots set them on a saucer filled them with soil uh, put some clones into it uh, i let the root ball develop at the bottom um so it, it kind of held all soil at the bottom uh, and then we're just able to simply pick them up and then set them on top of the beds not dig a single hole uh, and then the plants would just continue growing downward, the roots would continue growing downward into the beds. Um, now, when we first did this, it was all I was thinking was reducing labor um, was, was the main goal. Uh, and and we, we achieved that. We, we, it turned a, what took us a day and a half turned into a half day. Um, I, I have two female growers that run my entire facility. Um, and it took them a half day to place, we call it placing a room. Um, we don't plant, we place. Um, so anyways we, we started with a small bed here and there i'm um, doing it I, I didn't show it at first because I, I was too embarrassed to for a long time i had to make sure it works because uh, <laughs> no way nobody was doing this at the time you know i want to put my foot in my mouth um, so i actually did it for about a year or so um and then people started seeing um, pictures of the of the bed in the corner we started asking questions what's going on over there um and then we did the whole grassroots i reached out to tyler from grassroots i had him make a fabric version of the pot without a bottom on it uh, and those guys are awesome, by the way, whatever you need, those guys are willing to do. They're pretty, pretty cool and, and very versatile. Um, anyways, so we ran with the bottomless pot technique and just kind of designed a whole system off it. And uh, what we kind of learned was, yes, it's going to drastically save um, the amount of labor and the amount of mess you make, the amount of soil disturbance, all those things. Um, we're definitely going to cut back on it. Um, but then to our surprise is we got faster, better growth rates. Um, we, we managed to reduce the amount of transplant shock. Uh, the plants seem to just take off faster and healthier. So um, in my system, we can't really shed time off of it, but I get 4.3 cycles a year, um, just to be clear on that. Uh, so I get I get, uh, <laughs> yeah, I get 13 harvests a year is what I get. Um, but uh, we, we can't really afford to shave time the way my systems work. I have seasons set uh, and, and my seasons don't wait for plants. My plants don't wait for the season. Um, it's just, it's a clockwork. I've been running the same schedule for eight and a half years now without missing a single beat. Um, uh i forgot my I forgot what i was saying with that um yeah my bad where were we at about that sorry uh no you you covered a lot of it um i, I guess what so the, the originally started as like a labor saving thing and then it became an actual like better not only was it saving labor but it was also um, yeah well, I was saying, I, I giving save, you better yields yeah i couldn't save time because of our schedule but what i did was in the same amount of time I had allocated to grow my plants and veg, veg my plants, um, I was able to grow my plants twice as big. So it, it, it didn't save me time in it because, again, we're kind of set on a, on a, on a schedule, but it, it did get more out of the time. So uh, our plants just went to flower much bigger, much healthier, and we've seen a huge increase in yields by doing it um, over time. Um, the only place I would say it might not work, uh, one, if you're a home gardener and, and you got a small sale, maybe a ceiling height is an issue. Um, uh, maybe it's not the best technique for you. Um, but if you're a large scale commercial grower, you're planting, you know, thousands of plants a month uh, and you have high base ceilings, uh, I definitely think it's a, te a technique worth trying. Uh, try it on one bed first or try it on one pot first. See if you like it. Um, I, I think you'd be surprised on how easy and how just simple the whole thing works. Yeah, it's definitely something I want to play around with. I think it's a really interesting concept um, and very like very in ingenious. So I yeah hats off to you on that i think it's very cool um 
w- one question I had is what lessons have you learned in terms of like, like tips and pointers for people who want to try it out? Like, uh, is there a certain size pot that you think works best? Um, I, I don't know any watering differences. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say, uh, make sure you clear the soil off. You don't want to be setting it on like, uh, if you, if you're running a living mulch or any type of mulch, you don't want to set it on top of your mulch. That's just, this doesn't cause decomposing in the root zone, uh, like rotting and stuff like that that you want to avoid. Um, so make sure you clear it, get a nice little access point to the soil, straight into the soil when you set it down. Um, I recommend watering the pots directly, um, at least a couple times a week for the first, like, you know, two week and a half, two weeks, um, give the, the, the plants time for the roots to grow into the beds. Um, so the, cause you don't get quite enough capillary reaction to, to water up through those pots from the bed. So, um, you're going to want to water them directly. Once the roots get into the bed, you're fine. You can kind of ignore the pots and just focus on the bed at that point. Um, other than that, yeah, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. I, I do the video on my Instagram, um, that kind of, uh, explained it and people ask me all the time and it looks like I don't answer, but all I do is I tag them in the original video. Um, so that I don't have to explain the whole thing. So if, if feel free to ask me online anytime, I'm just going to go and tag you in the original video and you can watch it. It's about 10 minutes long. Uh, and it gives a whole detailed breakdown on, on what I've learned and not much has changed, um, since I made that video and I don't think anything has really changed um since the making of that video um yeah it's still running it very strong now uh our state regulators hated the idea of bottomless pots and fought me insanely hard on the idea for absolutely no reason um and uh what's that yeah they actually even called tyler and they had all kinds of weird like that was crazy um but it's now it's a it's a, a validated uh, technique that you can use in nevada um they, they aren't arguing nice. anymore, so that's kind of cool that's good. So they wanted to talk to the manufacturer of the pots about, yeah, they, 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 that's they, crazy. Yeah, you gotta understand these regulators, they come in, they walk a thousand grows and they're all, you know, sterile, um, you know, chemical facilities and they walk into GLP and they're just like, what is this place? No way. Any of this is legal. Um, uh, so there's always this huge learning curve that we have to, um, walk them through. And this last year, this new regulators of the CCB in Nevada have been extremely difficult um, and we've spent a lot of time educating them on just organics in general um, for everybody's sake, because a lot of these regulating bodies are going to take these same um, regulations and just kind of repeat them over and over again until we get to federal legalization. So if one yeah. state's successful in something, then the other states is going to repeat it. S- similar to the Sasquagillus thing, we need to nip this in the ass before um, cannabis becomes federally legal, because then we ain't going to be able to change anything. Um, but for the most part, uh, yeah, bottomless pots for the win for sure. Yeah. You know, it's funny cause people see us online and sort of, you know, I guess we have personas or, you know, we share what, what we do and what we believe and, and people think that we're, um, you know, we don't agree on a lot of stuff or that we're like opposed to each other. But in reality, like at the end of the day, like we're all trying to promote regenerative practices, sustainable agriculture, organic cultivation. Um, we're all on the same side. And, uh, I love being able to have these conversations because one of the things I I struggle with online and it's really discouraging. And I bet you see this too, is like anyone can leave a comment on your video. Anyone can make a comment on social media and they can be, they can be jerks. They can say whatever they want and be critical. And like, this is your life. This is your career. This is what feeds your family. And you put a lot of your passion into it and it can be really discouraging. Um, so like, and it's hard to have a civil conversation, you know, personal attacks come into play, other things that aren't related to the topic. And I found that people like yourself that I can have a conversation with and stay on topic, even if we, you know, have slight dif- differences in opinion, um, that level of respect goes a long way. So thank you. No, I, I appreciate you, man. There's not too many people's opinion. I appreciate or respect more than yours. That's why I, I started off saying this. Like if people don't listen to you and, 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 and consider what you're saying, they're only going to prove you right as far as um, no cover crops and things of that nature. You have to listen to everything you say, everything you've ever said, whether I disagree with it or not, I had to take into consideration. I mean, it, it kind of pushed me to either, you know, level up or, or even change some things, you know? Awesome, man. Well, you, you challenged me too. And, uh, if people like this podcast, we'll have to follow up with other topics and other conversations. Cause, uh, I think it, I think it's a lot of fun and I, I enjoy the chat. So 
Thanks again for your time. Um, quick, I got one question for you before we go, because you mentioned something oh, uh, yeah. earlier that caught yeah. me before I get to the component. You can cut this out later if you want. Um, you mentioned, <laughs> um, uh, I saw a video earlier, you were talking about teas, and you had mentioned a manure tea um, that people do and then how it could have certain contaminants. Um, and I just want to be real, I just want to say something to some people real quick. Uh, I know we don't like talking regulations and things like that, but in the last two years, I've learned some really important things for a soil food wave community that y'all need to take into consideration. Um, and there's certain, um, guidelines in, in the, in, um, regulations that we have to follow that no one is. Um, so when the state tried to shut me down, um, one of the things that they quoted me on was, I think it was a, it was an NOP water guideline quality. Was it NOP, right? So it was an NOP water quality guidelines um, saying you have to have below a certain amount of like E. coli and uh, this other mm -hmm. um, type of bacteria. Um, so in order for you to do a compost tea, you have to have a, uh, uh, you have to have a thermophil or a, a validated method of composting. So you have to use like a thermophil compost. Um, so yep. that, that, that could be a problem for a lot of KNF guys who use their IMOs and, and, and things like that. Not to say that there's an issue with those techniques, but I'm saying if they're not validated by the USDA or NOP, um, you're not going to be able to use them much longer. Okay. Now, once you get a validated method like thermophilic composting, you end up with a good high quality compost. Then you make a tea brew and you have to make two separate tea brews with the same recipe and get them both tested by a third party lab to show that they're below a certain amount of, 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 uh, of E. coli and I can't remember where the other bacteria is. Um, until you do that, you cannot legally use a compost tea. Now, extracts without brewing, you can use without limitation uh, if you're using a thermophilic compost. But teas, you have to get tested by a third party. Um, just throwing that out there, guys. Uh, it sucks. I did it. Um, and it's a yearly thing. Is that in the, that's in the state of Nevada then? Yeah, but it's, it's, it's actually, it's actually an NOP um, type USDA water guideline thing. So it's actually a national restriction that the state of Nevada found and just try to hold me to. We, we looked for months before we even found out how to use Chris Von Hook from Clean Green Certified to actually find the regulation they were speaking of because they misquoted the number and just sent us on this rat race. Um, so people just got to realize that, uh, like uh, the Dr. Lane Ingham, I kind of hinted at it earlier. Um, there's a lot of things you do is like with counting, um, you know, in science and, and a lot of these, um, these regulators, if you can't count it, it's not science, it's bro science and you're done. Um, uh, so that's why a lot of those crazy things I don't really sign up for so much or, uh, subscribe to, um, they, they, they do kind of make sense, um, under the right, you know, perspective, uh, under, under the, the, the realm of regulation, I guess. Uh, so just be careful if you're out there, if you're, if you're using these validated techniques, you're trying to write SOPs, um, based off of, um, something you did in your home grow, uh, just, just take a look to look, take a time to look into USDA. And I'm, I'm not a fan of USDA um, regulations or any regulations for that matter. Uh, but it, it's worth looking into before designing an entire system, um, around practices that may not be, you know, allowed. Yeah. I mean, there are NOP guidelines that actually, I don't know if they've tried to apply these to you, but, um, I think it's 60 days before harvest, you can't mm -hmm. apply a compost tea and that's just a standard NOP guideline yeah. that's been around for decades. Um, uh, just to prevent E. coli salmonella contamination on, on and that's, and I, leafy I think, greens and things like that. Yeah. And then I think that's a, again, that's a compost tea regulation. And I think that's also if you're using manure in your compost or, or animal byproducts, mm -hmm. I think is when that one comes into play. If I'm not mistaken, the exact uh, uh, verbiage in that one. Um, but yeah, no, that's a, there's a hundred percent little, little, little tricks like that. You have to be aware of um, again, like if, if this is a cash crop, so people is, it's becoming more and more popular and, and it more money, more problems for the organic grower. I'll, I'll tell you that for sure. So uh, it just helps to be aware of these things um, for sure. I, I recommend people getting online, just kind of looking at USD regulations and kind of applying that to their facility as much as possible, just for the long-term su success of their facility or their business. Um, it's definitely worth looking at. Yeah, I think the regulatory side is important. I think the, the actual risk associated with compost teas is, is significantly lower. Um, than is stated by a lot of people. And that's, uh, you know, this idea that people need to move to a compost extract um, from a regulatory reason. I, I think that can make a lot of sense, but aerated compost teas in general have so much more microbial activity and nutrient cycling that they, I think they have a lot of benefit um, when you use the right compost. Um, that's really the, the key to it. And, you know, a brewer that's gonna create the optimal, you know, dissolved oxygen levels that you need. But um, yeah, my dad did testing with Elaine 
you know, decades ago where they intentionally introduced E. coli and it was, you know, the KISS brewer that they, they used and found that E. coli they couldn't survive in, in some of these highly aerobic conditions. So, uh, you know, I'm, like I said, I think, I think the risk is overstated, but it's absolutely there. Um, a lot of the failures I hear for people failing for E. coli in, in agriculture were actually from like having cows upstream that were crapping in the water. And then that irrigation water gets pumped onto the leaves of the plants. And then, and then the plants get, you know, the lettuce and stuff gets hit. So yeah, manures are definitely something that, that people need to be careful with. And, and yeah, I think I should probably do some more posts on, on compost tea. Cause, uh, yeah, it's, a, I'm a huge, it's an interesting topic. And I, I love compost teas. I think less is more as far as their food source. I think there's a lot of problems people have is they overfeed their compost teas. It goes anaerobic before they can get back. And then uh, now they're just kind of watering, you know, some silly at poop soup kind of thing going on. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's the main thing is like on, on commercial scale, extract teas are harder to mess up um, where I could brew a bad tea and have to dump it down the drain. Um, so I, I, my book, my garden, my, my growers are all certified on the Elaine system. Um, so they know how to use a microscope and check teas. Um, as far as like human pathogens, we, we've never had an issue with human pathogens and teas. It's always just been with the wrong organisms as far as like ciliates. Uh, they've been the, the, the main game changer for a good tea versus a bad tea. Um, just, yeah. It's not very efficient nutrient cyclers uh, in, the, in the long run. Um, but yeah, uh, compost teas for, for foliars, uh, extracts for drenches. That's kind of our, our routine. Yeah. And I don't think people realize just how much fertility they're bringing in sometimes with these compost teas. Um, they're probably getting nitrates, uh, as well as other minerals. And so we've seen people that are like, we didn't do anything this cycle, but compost teas and their soil tests show an increase in fertility at the end of the cycle, sometimes with nitrogen being like way too high. So it is something that I, I want to mention for folks that are considering, you know, some of these KNF options, some of the, the, um, compost teas, whether it's an extract or a aerated compost tea, um, you are bringing in nutrients and those can impact your plant for better or for worse. A lot of times it's for the better, but it's something to be aware of. Yeah. hundred no, percent. Same thing with the cover crops. And, you know, if you're chopping and dropping your cover crops, you know, seven weeks into flower, um, you then create some microbial explosion in your soil, some nutrient cycling is going to take place. Um, it might be counter um, productive to what you're trying to achieve as far as um, growing a good taste in plant. So, uh, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Well, I've heard, I haven't, I've never tried uh GLP flower, but everyone I've talked to that has tried it says that it is it's top shelf and it's great stuff. So, uh, yeah, hats off to you and your crew out there. Well, I appreciate you. Appreciate your time today. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out, man. If you have any questions, uh, I always appreciate um, what you got to say, man, for sure. All right. Awesome. Thanks, man. All right. Thanks, Tom. That was Steve Cantwell, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. If you like the podcast, please leave us a rating and review and give us a follow on Instagram. We also have a Patreon where you can get insider access to the team at Kiss Organics through Hangouts, as well as earn some cool perks and benefits for supporting the podcast. Lastly, you can sign up for our newsletter on our website homepage to stay up to date on the latest research and information. Thanks for listening.